Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to start right into it, even though it's only 4.02, because everyone has been very timely today. So uh, thank you all for coming to the Falmouth Art Center's fifth virtual art reception. I'm Laura Reckford, Executive Director of the Falmouth Art Center. We have a very nice audience tonight with of our Falmouth Art Center family, some of our regulars to these art receptions um, and many artists and art appreciators, just like we would have at one of our in-person receptions. So we're really enjoying these, these virtual programs, uh, which allow some friends and family from out of town to also uh, come and join us for these. We have a wonderful program lined up for you this afternoon. There are several people who signed up who cannot attend. So we are recording this session and we will send it to all those who couldn't make it tonight. Before we start, uh, some of you know, I always like to give my Zoom tips. Most of you are very familiar with Zoom, but for those who aren't, please mute yourself or we will mute you. And that's so we don't hear your dog barking, your neighbor uh, calling up, your spouse asking for dinner, whatever it may be. Um, you can put questions anytime through the chat key. And we ask that you put your use the chat key for your questions. It's at the bottom center of your Zoom screen. And that way you don't interrupt the presenters. And then we will have plenty of time for questions after each of the presentations. You can use your speaker view and you can toggle between between your speaker view and your gallery view, if you like. But when the speakers, uh, the artists are presenting, you might prefer the speaker view because then you'll see the artist on the big screen and that will be very helpful for you to view their studios and so forth. Uh, when we do share the screen, you will see the speaker in a small box and you can control whether you see a couple of additional boxes by clicking above the boxes. Um, and you can also move those boxes around on your screen, your screen. And a few announcements. We do have three new shows up at the Art Center now. As many of you know, we have 36 shows a year here, one every month in all three galleries. We switch over all three galleries every month. And so we have Cape Cod Views with Paintings and Ceramics by Susan Varga up in our Siegel Gallery on the second floor. And we have a beautiful show, a texture crossover with work by Victor Goyetsky, um, who does sculptures, Will Kirkpatrick, who does uh, oil paintings, Leslie Kramer, who you'll meet uh, later, later today, who does uh, prints, printmaking, and Fran Merton, who does glass collage. And then we have Let There Be Light, our show in the Herman Gallery with over 100 pieces. Uh, we were um, just amazed by how our artists came out this month for our Herman Gallery show. And these are our, uh, members or non-members. Anyone can submit, but they are mostly members. And we did have to go to two different uh, rooms for that show because we had so many pieces. Uh, Dan Hannigan always does such a beautiful job hanging the exhibit. We did go from our Herman Gallery into our classroom space on the first floor to fit in all the wonderful pieces. And it's very inspiring. It's called Let There Be Light. And so you uh, you have this wonderful positivity in that exhibit. So I, people have been really enjoying it. Just opened a couple days ago. We are open seven days a week and we are free for anyone to come. Uh, and now to the main event, here's what is on the agenda today. The three artists presenting today, we have printmaker Leslie Kramer, we have artist Melissa Morris, and ceramics artist Kim Sheeran. Uh, they're all, again, very inspirational artists, and they'll be talking about their artwork, including their work on display here, and giving tours of their studios. Again, if you have any questions during the talks, please put them in the chat, and I will ask the questions during the Q&A um, or earlier if needed. And so we'll start from hearing from award-winning printmaker, Leslie Kramer of Brewster. Leslie studied art and French at Brown University and received her MFA in print, 
printmaking from RISD. She spent a year in Paris studying printmaking at Atelier 17 with the renowned artist Stanley Hayter. She taught printmaking and humanities at Elmira College in New York for 26 years. And her work is included in many private and public collections, including the Cape Cod Museum of Art and the Boston Public Library. She is a past president of Printmakers of Cape Cod and helped organize Journey, an exchange exhibit between 20 British printmakers and 20 artists from Cape Cod for the Mayflower 400 celebration which will be exhibited in England in 2021. She is represented by Cross Rip Gallery in Harwich Port. And we will be sharing a video um, with Leslie. And so uh, we'll, we'll look forward to that. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Thank you, Laura. I'm currently in my living room um, and from here, Laura will be, after my introduction, Laura will be um, showing a video taken by one of my students. And I want to thank Amy Darbyshire, who was my videotaper for this event. Um, I'd also like to thank Irene Hecht for organizing the exhibit, Texture Crossover which is in the lobby gallery at the Falmouth Art Center. And I'd like to thank Laura Reckford, the uh, director for all of the work that she's done to publicize this event. So um, I hope that you enjoy my video which explains some of the techniques that I use in printmaking. And the term print has so many uh, meanings in our world. And often people think of it as a print being a reproduction. But the kind of printmaking that I do is only an original print. And um, an original print may, be, may include many different techniques. And one thing that I want to address very briefly is my use of symbols in some of the artwork that's in the exhibit. Here's a sample of one of the pieces. It's called Summer Song, and this is in the exhibit. And um, it does, include several different techniques, which I like to use. The top section um, is an image of the sun done as a linoleum block print. The middle section um, is an image of the reeds in the marsh. And uh, in Brewster, I lived near a beautiful marsh uh, behind the Museum of Natural History. And I will demonstrate the printing of this in the video. So the final section contains um, symbols derived from cuneiform, which is a very ancient alphabet. And to me, writing is another mode of communication and it's visual and oral communication as art is. So this does not, is not a readable message. To me, it's an expression of the sounds in the marsh. So it might refer to the sound of the wind in the grasses or the waves as the tide rises or the sounds of the birds in the marsh. So that's my brief introduction and I hope you enjoy the video. So Laura, I think we're ready for the video. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Leslie Kramer, and I'm going to uh, do a little talk today about printmaking. <clears throat> we are in my printmaking studio on Cape Cod, and um, I've been doing printmaking for a long time, probably 50 years. And uh, I was fortunate to study printmaking in Paris with an artist, Stanley W. Hayter. This is his book, New Ways of Gravure. And he worked with the Surrealists um, and was very influenced by Cubism. Um, in the 20th century, and he died in 1987. So um, I spent a year learning how to do printmaking in his studio, which was quite an adventure. Um, and I had never been to Europe. I had been to New York City. That was the furthest I'd been. And um, I sailed across the ocean and had a very adventurous year in Paris. So he is known for a technique called viscosity printing. And <clears throat> that uh, is a method of printing several colors at the same time. This was a little test that I did, actually made this in Paris, and instead of printing each color separately, he used the viscosity of the inks and different depths of the plate to print several colors all in one run through the press. So I want to talk to you about printmaking in general, and printmaking is a broad term that encompasses several different techniques. The ones that I'm going to talk about today are intaglio, which includes etching, dry point, collagraph, engraving, and aquatint, among other things. And um, I often like to combine different techniques in my artwork. Uh, this is one piece that's in the exhibit at the Art Center in Falmouth. And this is a combination of linoleum block print and etching. This part is the etching, and I'm going to demonstrate how this is printed today. Um, the term intaglio means to cut into. So with an intaglio print, the deep areas of the plate are etched by acid and ink is pushed into the lines and the surface is wiped clean. For the um, linoleum block prints, here is this little cuneiform type symbols. And here we cut into the soft linoleum with a gouge and then roll ink on the surface. So it's just the opposite of intaglio printmaking. Here, we're printing the surface, and here we're printing the deep areas. That's the basic difference. So, I'm going to begin um, with my demo. And here is some etching ink I'm using oil-based ink, 
uh, because it gives a very intense color. And you can see it's quite stiff. Um, and the stiffness relates to the viscosity of the ink. That is how much oil is in the ink. Because this ink is going to be pushed into the deep areas, we want it quite stiff. So to start with, I'm going to put on my best gloves. Oh, I like these cotton gloves because they're much more comfortable than rubber gloves. And I like to find them at garage sales. So first of all, I'm going to apply the ink to the plate by pushing it into the deep lines and I'm covering the whole surface of the plate with the ink. And I will then have to remove the ink from the top surface, but leave it in those deeply etched areas. Now, this is an older plate. It's a zinc plate. And this was etched with nitric acid, which is very strong. And more recently, I have been using ferric chloride, which is a lot less toxic. And I use that on copper. So here I am removing some of the excess ink from the surface of the plate. And I'm doing this with a starched cheesecloth, which is called tarlatan. Typically in etching, uh, the artist makes the plate and then prints an addition, which is a group of prints as alike as possible. And in order to do that, you need to be able to repeat your movements when you're wiping the plate. So first I, I did the rough removal of the ink. Now I'm gonna use a circular motion to continue removing some of the ink from the surface, but I'm working very lightly because I don't wanna pull the ink out of the deep areas. And you can see the image is starting to appear. So once I start to see the image, then I can use a piece of newsprint or an old phone book, that's what I usually use, and wipe it a little bit more cleanly. This is called a newspaper wipe. So if there is a little ink on the newspaper, it helps attract some of the ink that's on the surface of the plate. Sometimes an artist will want to leave a tone on the surface, and that's known as plate tone. In this case, I want it to be quite clean. Okay, so that looks good. Then the final thing I can do is called hand wiping. And I'm using the palm of my hand to make sure that the surface of the plate is free of ink, but the lines are filled with ink. 
Also, another technique that's here is called aquatint, which is the toned area of the plate. And you will see that once it's printed. You can control the value or the tonal quality depending on how you apply the aquatint, which is a fine powder that sticks to the plate and then you etch it in acid. So this is white. And now I'm gonna show you an additional technique, which is called chine collet. I got some small pieces of rice paper. Chine collet is a method for adding color and texture to a print with rice paper, what we call rice paper. The translation of chine collet from the French is glued Chinese chine, Chinese collet glued. Now, what I just did was I sprinkled wheat paste on the back of the rice paper. And that's also a misnomer because rice paper is actually made from mulberry fibers. So I'm applying the, the rice paper which I have um, pre-cut to the correct size. And I'm laying it on top of the inked plate. Now we're gonna place the plate on the etching press. And I have um, a piece of paper under it, which is the same size as the printing paper so that I can get it centered. And over here is my printing paper. <clears throat> which has been dampened for at least 20 minutes. Printmaking paper is 100% rag paper and it's very durable. It's made of cotton fibers or linen fibers. Uh, and it's actually more durable than canvas <clears throat> if it's taken proper care of. Um, paintings have to be relined sometimes the, over several hundred years, whereas uh, prints never have that problem. So I'm just lining this up and I'm going to send it through the press. I'm using three felts to cushion the pressure so that we get a good impression without tearing the paper. Unfortunately, long ago, I was careless, I was excited because I found uh, quite a few of these metal letters and I ran it through the press and unfortunately I put an E in the middle of this felt. So I can't erase that, but I always have to work around it <laughs> and make sure that it doesn't become on top of the image or it would show. Okay, here we go. This is my... Um and this is a Dickerson press 
which I've had for many years. So you can see the impression of the plate in the paper. And here is the print. Now, there's a harsh line right there. So I'm not too happy about that. That's the Chincolé paper. It was just for the demonstration. But you can see the lines turned out nicely. And uh, it adds a bit of tone or color in the sky. So thank you very much for watching my demonstration. And we're back. Thank you, Leslie. That was, I'm just fascinated by that video. And I know those of us who love this concept of the process of art, that's really, uh, printmaking is, is a very intense process and it's really fun to see that come together. So turning it uh, back over to you for any comments and then uh, people should feel free to, to ask questions anytime as well. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> Questions for Leslie on pr the on printmaking. I I do have a I do have a. Okay, Paul, question. go ahead. <laughs> Leslie, when when you initial when you initially want to put the drawing on the plate, yeah, you draw directly on the plate, and then how do you do the process of the etching material there to hold the design? Good question. Uh, first, with etching, you cover the plate with an acid resistant material called the ground. And the ground <clears throat> is made of wax and tar uh, and some solvent. So you can brush the ground on and let it dry and it covers everything. Then you need to remove the ground wherever you want the acid to etch. And there's uh, many techniques of transferring your image to the plate. Now, a very important thing about printmaking is that it's the mirror image. The print is the mirror image of what is on the plate. So printmakers have to think in reverse. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of backwards. <laughs> but basically, that's, that's what you do. Is, is there a time period that you have to let the acids get into the plate? Like if you're working with copper, is it, I know you use a different chemical, but um, yes. is there a time period that, to yes, determine there. the depths of the print? There Absolutely. is. Okay. Exactly. Um, the longer you leave it in the acid, generally, the deeper the line, the line will hold more ink, so it will appear darker. Gotcha. And with aqua tint, uh, that's a very delicate thing because it's just a very fine powder sprinkled on the plate. So usually people will do a test, but in that case, it may only need to be in the acid for a few minutes. Whereas if you're etching a deep area, it might need to be in for a half hour or so. And the conditions vary depending on <clears throat> the temperature in the room. If it's warm, it'll go faster. Uh, so there are many variables in the process. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for your questions. Any other questions for Leslie? Questions about printmaking for Leslie? I'm, I'm looking through the the crowd here to see if anyone wants to pipe in with a question for Leslie. I don't see any questions. And there'll be time at the end as well. If you think of one uh, during the other presentations, we'll open it up at the end for questions for every for all three artists. So um, thank you so much, Leslie. Thank, thank you, you for showing us that, that printmaking demonstration. 
And, uh, um, and now we go to Melissa Morris. Melissa Morris is a fine art painter and artist who has, who lives and works in her studio at 46 Pearl Street in the, in Hyannis on the High Arts campus. Uh, she is currently the town of Barnstable's artist in residence. Um, her statement about her art is that she uses the painting process as an intimate language to process the world around her. She is inspired by nature, time, life, and death. She often explores ideas that question, confirm, and or expand our psychological, emotional, and spiritual understanding of our human selves and the world we live in. And turning it over to Melissa. By the way, Melissa teaches two classes here at the at the Falmouth Art Center: abstract painting and collage. And we've just been so delighted to have her, her here as a teacher. She started teaching here during the pandemic, so they've been online classes. And uh, her students um, uh, really ha have given me incredible feedback about how much they've learned from Melissa. So without further ado, turning it over to Melissa Morris. Um, I was just trying to make myself big, but I- <laughs> We've got, if people can do the speaker view and then Melissa will be big. Okay, good. So I'm big. <laughs> I'm big. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, so I am Melissa Morris. I live and work um, at Stu Studio 46 here in Hyannis. Uh, I thought I would, I was asked to sort of share the work that I have in the show. And then I thought I would share some of the big projects that I've been working on um, with the town and the community. And um, I've kind of like put my hands into a little sculpture recently, which I'm sort of excited about. And I have some images to show you. Um, so let's see, I'll pull up, hopefully I can do this correctly. Um, this is the image I have in the show. It's called Accidental Magic. Um, the whole piece is the, the image to the left and it's a lot of mixed media and collage. Um, I use inks, uh, watercolor, acrylic, oil pastel, rice paper, which now, thanks to Leslie, I know is not actually made with rice, <laughs> but I do use it a lot. Um, I actually love that it has a transparent quality. And then over to the right, I showed, I took some images. I've been really interested and I really suggest everyone to do this in taking uh, close up images of my work at angles and skewed slightly because it's really just opening up my mind um, for different compositions and just different shapes that I wouldn't really necessarily come up with on my own. Um, and I think that, you know, we're so often just look at stuff through the computer or the phone, or even in a gallery space, we stand in front of a painting and just look at it straight on. Um, but I personally don't work that way. I, I work um, on a flat table, I turn stuff around. Um, and uh, you, I just really like this idea that we really need to kind of see things from different angles um, and really engage and participate in how we view things, um, which really kind of stemmed from these larger projects that I've been working on. So I will go right into um, a re most recently this summer, I was involved in a grant through the town of Barnstable through the Mass Cultural Council um, in beautifying and activating um, spaces in downtown Hyannis. And so this is a huge project that I worked on. This is just little bits and pieces of it. There's a location um, down on Main Street in the middle of Main Street, right next to Colombo's restaurant, if you're familiar with the area. And then at the top right, um, that image at night. Unfortunately, I'm always working so diligently through the day. And then by the time I clean everything up and I'm like, oh, I didn't take pictures. I'm taking images at night. So <laughs> the images are always <laughs> sort of these um, light reflectors happening. Um, but it's all about engaging um, the community and getting them to sort of stay a little longer and um, participate in, in the environment. And so um, a, a few people in the town of Barnstable, we got together and we ended up getting this grant 
Um, and this is actually uh, just the first two locations. And in the spring, when the weather warms up, I'm actually scheduled to go um, install eight more locations. Um, and these, these murals are a combination of like hopscotch, um, jump over, as you can see, follow the line. Um, and in these circles, these circles are six feet um, sort of diameter and they, there's tons of them everywhere. And they're, they're, they have words and phrases to, to get you to engage um, in your senses, like what you see, what you feel. Um, even what you taste. And then some of them even have dance prompts or hop on the spot or um, twirl. And so it's really fun. And, and actually it's got me, it really inspired me. This was sort of the largest I'd ever worked through a space. Um, and it, I, I'd go back to check on the paint and make sure everything was clean. And I would see people um, approaching these, these murals that are on the ground. And they would come along and all of a sudden they would just start hopping <laughs> or skipping or jumping or twirling. And it was and, and then they'd walk away and I would look at them and I could see that something changed in them. You know, there was a smile or a sense of relief or a sense of engagement. And this aha moment happened in my mind. Um, as an abstract artist, I'm always trying to get people to be emotionally engaged in my work, right? Like I want them to feel affected or, you know, to feel something when they look at my work. And it was, uh, it dawned on me that if I want to get my viewers to, to be, um, to have an emotive response, I got to get them moving, <laughs> right? They physically have to move. Um, which has led me into this huge sculpture that I'm going to show you. And I have some images of the process and into my current work where I'm working on 24 foot long paper scrolls of mixed media material. Um, Cause I really want some movement to happen. I want, I want my viewers and my observers to be engaged and somehow participate um, in the process of seeing my work. All right, so now I'll show you um, the progression of the, what I have called the Dreams in the Trees series. Um, and this is the process of me making it, the diameter of this circle that you're seeing or this nest um, is 20 feet long. Um, and I don't, I, there was some write up of, in the paper and they accidentally said it was 80 feet diameter, <laughs> which, is huge in, compar in, to, in comparison, but it's still pretty large. Um, you'll see some of the images, it, it is pretty large. So it's 20 feet in diameter and it's about 63 um, feet around its circumference. And uh, about this, you know, around December last year, I made about 20 or 30 dream catchers for friends and family. I just wanted to give something to everyone that I had handmade. Um, and if you've ever done any weaving or, or made anything like that, there's this constant repetitive um, movement of weaving and wrapping and tying, weaving, wrapping and tying. Um, and it, over this last year, obviously we all know we've gone through such hell and back, right? With everything. Um, I really wanted to put something out there that was healing um, and put really good energy out there. And, um, I, I was telling some of my students earlier, I, I read the book I, and I hope if you haven't read it, you guys will read it. It's called um, Big Magic by Liz Gilbert. Um, and she talks a lot about your inspirations for things. And if you don't jump on them, then they'll leave you, right? You have those thoughts that run through your mind or these ideas or images that run through your mind. And if you don't jump on it, then they're gonna find some other vessel to come into fruition. And uh, after last year, when I made all those dream catchers for my friends and family, out back, I looked out behind my studio, there's these trees with this natural arch. And all I could see all year long was this huge dream catcher just in the trees. And it, it just gnawed at me. Like I would dream about it and I would think about it. And every time I looked out there, I could just see this dream catcher. 
And I read Big Magic again for like the fourth time. And I said, Melissa, you got to make this happen. You got to make this happen. So I just started. Um, I just started to do it. I didn't, I didn't really have a real plan. Um, I just knew that I needed to make this big, huge dream catcher. Uh, and I pulled together on the left, you can see this nest of twigs and branches that I piled together. And then I started twining it together. Uh, and then I weaved it. You can see me in the middle at the top there. I'm in the center of it. I'm weaving this, you know, this color. And I played a lot with uh, what color should go where, I mean, what kind of effect it, it would have. Um, and then I did it serendipitously. I didn't even realize this was going to happen, but it looked kind of cool right on the ground. I <laughs> I kind of played with just maybe keeping it on the ground, but then, you know, I, I, I had to push myself and kind of organize the people um, to make it get into the trees. Um, so this is the image now up in the trees. Um, you can see it's up. Another serendipitous um, element of the, of the sculpture is if you see right in the center, the shape actually is supposed to be more of a circular shape, but the way that it fit into the trees, it transformed it into this like teardrop or seed or egg shape, which I thought was so um, really kind of on point for what we all need right now, right? This new beginning, a uh, new year, um, hopefully sort of putting good, good newness out there. Um, and then some other serendipitous things that happened um, is that when you're actually out there, and I'm, I invite all of you, if you can, it's in Hyannis, right on um, South Street, you can come look at it and spend some time with it if you'd like. Um, it's outside. And some other things that are really beautiful about it is when you're out there, I didn't anticipate it, but the wind kind of moves the, um, the yarn a bit when it's out there it moves in and out and so it has like this sense like it's breathing uh, with the wind um, and then when you stand on the side and look at it it has this convex or concave thing happening that creates this almost eyeball effect um, which is really beautiful and I, I write about it I, I talk about how it appears and disappears um, as you move it around, the yarn is so thin that sometimes it just disappears. You can hardly even see it. But then if you catch it just right, um, the angle, all of the strings sort of overlap and the color becomes more saturated. And then so these, these are sort of the daytime images. And then at night, um, the thing just glows. The, um, I sort of love kind of go on, going out there and, and seeing um, the moon through it, the stars through it. There's something really magical that happens. Um, at night, and uh, I re I'm waiting for it to, for us to have a good rain and a good freeze so that I can get some icicle effects on it, <laughs> sort of happening and appearing on the piece. So like I said, this is outside and right at uh, 46 Pearl Street behind the studio. You're all welcome to come see it whenever you'd like. Um, and so, so those are some of the really big projects that I've been working on. And now I'll just take you uh, through the studio a little bit. I'll go slow because I don't want you to get seasick, but I'll just go really slow. And um, if there's any questions about any of the materials or what I'm doing, then you can put them in the comments, okay? So a very big part of my um, creation is through music, actually. Um, so I have a lot, I play the ukulele and the guitar. I just finished this eight day intensive workshop where I wrote and composed and, and created words um, to nine songs, original nine songs, which is really kind of wonderful for the new year. So that's my little music station. And I'll just step on back. This is actually the table where I teach. I know some of you are teachers probably interested um, so that this is this cool thing. I used to use this gooseneck thing, but it, it kept breaking on me. So I found this more mechanical metal um, device that holds my iPad that I can use and move it around. It, it folds up, it folds down, I can go flat. I, I teach a lot of um, kids classes. So I have tons of markers, crayons, colored pencils. Uh, and so this is sort of like my desk. I kind of call this the classroom space here. And then I just have, you know, just like all of you artists out there, I have containers for materials. I have this huge work table here that I, I set up um, and I have glass tops on top so I can mix paints. 
Um, and then I have just this wall that's kind of like the, when I'm teaching the gallery wall behind me. Um, and I have a couple of things that I'm working on. I do have my hands in a lot of things at the same time. Um, I have this series here that I've been working on since for the, uh, for about eight months or so. I'm on number 67. So <laughs> there's 67 of these guys. Um, here's just a little like sort of experimenting that I've been doing recently. I just kind of kind of whip things out, play with different materials. Um, and then where my real kind of what's happening in my studio is, like I said, this 24 foot scrolls of paper and I'll just sort of get in here. I kind of just throw, I'm kind of a wild goose. I just throw everything down. I've been collecting um, for like you guys probably do these paper palettes. I love these things. Um, and I keep the, the dried paint on them. And I just discovered that if you take these things with the dried paint and put it onto a piece of paper and then iron it with a hot iron, it transfers the little like you know, color swatches. So uh, this this whole series, this whole big twenty four foot roll, actually is based on the, the these idea of these like color swatches. Uh, um, so so again, I have this huge table I set up, and I have the paper scroll rolled up, and I roll it up on one side and roll it up on the other side and work through it. Um, and then I have just a little my wall over here, a little series of collage. And then here is my sort of like inspiration table. I have um, caran uh, gouache, watercolor, old credit cards that I use to scrape things. I collect, when I'm out walking, I collect twigs and um, I always kind of have them up hanging. My family hates me because they're always walking into these tree branches and different things. Um, and also I collect things at the beach like seaweed always, you know, oh, there's always weird stuff hanging around um, that I can grab and kind of like use as inspiration in my work. And you can just see just the different materials that I use, um, distress markers, crappy paint, good paint, goldens, um, the water soluble stuff, love it all. And then again, we're back to the little music studio, I, I call it. All right, so I'm just gonna get right back into it. Hopefully that was a good. That was a wonderful tour, Melissa. And we did get um, some questions. Uh, someone wanted a repeat of the author's name and then another person listening answered and said it was Liz Gilbert. Um, and we had comments about how gorgeous the, the dream catcher in the trees is. And uh, another question, how did you get the dream catcher up in the tree? Is it attached in more than one place or does it move around? What a wonderful piece. I actually have a friend that's in landscaping and construction and I reached out to him and he helped me with an old Verizon truck, you know, one of those lifts. So we were able to get up into the trees and I actually wanted to use more natural material, but just for safety and security, I ended up just using zip ties to adhere it to the trees. And someone else asks if you know uh, Janet Eichelman's work. I do not. Okay, so that was <laughs> Sally Fine asking the question. Sally, I don't know if you want to um, say why you, you brought that up or give some more context to that question. Uh, she has done incredibly large pieces that are spanning skyscrapers. Uh, and she started small the way you did as, you know, an artist in resident using learning how to weave from uh, net makers in a seaside village. So she would be someone to look at for inspiration. She's pretty remarkable. As cool. I <laughs> really enjoyed your, your tour. Thank you. Thank you. And you all can see um, how inspirational Melissa is and everything she does. And I'm sure we're all just really taking in all those different things you just showed us, Melissa. So um, any other questions? for Melissa, and if you, if you think of them 
after um, afterwards, we'll have another chance at the end. So thank you so much, Melissa. That was amazing. And um, we will now uh, move on to Kim Sheeran. And uh, Kim uh, says in her artist statement that as a potter and maker of primarily functional art, she is always searching for new ways to use her potter's wheel and expand her vision of what is possible. And uh, January is reserved as a time of exploration for her, diving into ideas that have been percolating. Um, and uh, because she does a lot of teaching and uh, at, at her studio, at her, uh, her own studio, the barn studio, and also here at the art center and also um, other places around town. So uh, those con that consumes a lot of her time. And uh, she has a piece in our Let There Be Light exhibit, beautiful uh, pottery luminaries uh, that, that are here if, if you get a chance to come and see them. And uh, otherwise you might've seen them both in the Falmouth Enterprise and on the front page of the Cape Week on Friday uh, was a picture of her, her luminaries and they are quite exquisite. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kim Sheeran. And Kim, uh, you might be on mute. I don't see you All right, yet. can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Great, All right. there she is. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my studio is in Pocasset. I've been here for 24 years. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about, I have one of my luminaries that didn't, I didn't get quite ready for the show. To show you, can, am I on the big screen for everybody? You're, yes, um, everyone has control of their own large screen. So if you go to okay. speaker view, you can see Kim on the big screen. Okay. Um, so this is um, one of the luminaries that I didn't get into the show um, just because I didn't finish it. But um, as you can see, I like to do a lot of decorative detail. So um, I do stamping. So I make my own stamps um, out of clay. Typically, um, I also use some woodblock stamps that I've gotten up from India or um, carved stamps, um, but mostly I make my own stamps. I really like to have um, those stamps kind of are my a language kind of, um, so they are really unique to me. Um, so if you can see here, there's this image of a kind of a paisley and there's the image uh, right there. So these, just let me repeat my patterns. And then I also do some slip trailing. So the slip trailing, I use these little applicators. I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo after I show you the studio a little bit. But um, when I bought, when we bought this place, um, my studio space, there were 30,000 books in this space. So it was Bob's book barn and that's why I kept the barn as the barn pottery. Um, so this space has a giant fireplace, so I, ha it's, I sit, with my wheel, um, my back is to the fire so I can kind of stay warm. And then from there, I can kind of show you what my setup is like. If I can, I'm gonna pick up the um, computer now and just kind of hopefully turn it so that I don't make you guys all ill. <laughs> so you can tell me if it's like I'm doing the, can you see kind of my setup of um, my stamps and my slip trailers? Right now I'm working on a series of mugs. So you might be able to see those. And then from there I have basically a lot of inspiration around. So when I went to UNH, I went for studio art with a ceramics focus. So I, um, I do a little bit of everything and really try to focus on the ceramics, but I do get sidetracked. So up here, you might be able to see um, some of the pieces that I kind of started with, I was really influenced by Gustav Klimt and his ladies. And um, so this is kind of the evolution. So kind of from maiden to pregnancy to motherhood um, and then beyond with um, some other images, the lady with the fan um, and some other things like that. So over here, you'll be able to see um, some paintings from college, 
just all kinds of things on my bulletin board. Back in 2006, I went to India um, to work with women in the red light district. So I keep their images up. Um, I still do work against human trafficking and that's kind of my, the social justice piece to my work. I really feel it's important to um, work, work in community, but also work globally um, just to kind of <laughs> combat this horrific thing that happens to a lot of women. So here um, you can see my little Frida Kahlo tribute. She's one of my uh, muses. And um, my mom likes to paint, so she's painted some different things. So they're around as well. This up here is a piece that was at the Highfield Hall show. Some of you may have seen it, um, part of the Ancestry and Legacy show that happened this um, past summer. This piece is called Proud to be an American with a question mark. That still uh, remains to be seen, I guess. We'll see what happens, huh? Um, these pieces on the second shelf down here are kind of a new venture that I'm getting into um, with sacred vessels. So I have pieces that are, you know, to basically urns um, for humans and um, pets as well. So that is kind of something new that I'm getting into. And what I thought I would do now is kind of set this over here and hopefully you'll be able to see, let me do a little bit of a demonstration on some of the techniques that I do. Can you still hear me? Does anybody have any questions along the way? We can hear you and see you. Okay, good. All right, and can you see if I do that? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so these are some mugs um, that I have already done some stamping on and um, a little bit of sprigging. So sprigging is adding clay. Um, I like to just really make my pieces my own um, and just really, um, I don't know, I just have a kind of style and a technique that I do. So I'll make the piece, then I might shape it, then I will typically stamp it, add some slip after I've carved a foot. And at this point, I would do some scraffito. So I do scraffito. Scraffito was kind of my first love of um, how to decorate. So I do that with a couple of different tools. I start with this little wire loop tool and then I move on to a tool that has just like a little bit of a circle on it. And so what the scraffito is, is basically just carving through the clay or the slip so that you can see the clay color coming through. Now, typically I use a white clay body um, but because of the new year, I want something different. So this clay is called Dark Star and it's from North Carolina. It is a uh, native clay to North Carolina and it's from Starworks. And um, these really wonderful people, um, Hitomi and um, Takaro Shibata, they are Japanese and they are actively digging clay and basically just adding the minimal amount of um, what we need to use to make it usable for potters and sculptors, which is pretty cool. So every once in a while, we will get a batch of clay um, from North Carolina. And this is what I'm using for the, my first pots of the new year. So the carving, so this clay is a little bit on the wet side for the scraffito. So what I do is I'll carve my design with the smaller tool and then I'll go back over it and then really take a lot more material away so that you have a real strong image of the positive and the negative. So this is a wave design that I've been working with for a few years now. And um, I don't know, it just never gets old. It's just kind of a fun design for me and um, very locally inspired. Uh, I grew up on the water up in Rhine, New Hampshire. So uh, the water and the ocean are really important to me. And so, as you can see, I'll just go on and on with the, the scraffito process. And then once I'm done with that, I might flip it over and then do some slip trailing. So the slip trailing is basically just clay, or you can also use um, underglazes. And it's basically adding a layer on the outside of the piece. So it, you let the clay drip out.
And there you go. So that's kind of my process. Um, I work in batches. So um, like last week I made about 40 mugs. Um, I didn't quite finish decorating them. So this week I'll finish them. I kind of have rules for myself in the studio. So I can't start making anything until I've seen my pieces through the process because I'm I'll kind of get sidetracked sometimes and um, end up with so many pieces and not enough space because of teaching and I have a lot of other student work in here as well. Um, so we fired a cone 10. We have a gas kiln here. Um, we also fire a wood kiln at Chris Gustin's typically twice a year. Um, I really love the effects of the wood on my pieces. It really gives them kind of this, um, this modern antiquity kind of look. This old, they look like they've come out of the ocean or they've, they've had a, a previous life. And with my pieces, I really want people to feel special when they're using them. So that's kind of what all the details about is like, I really want each piece to be a unique piece. I typically don't make um, sets. I will, you know, when requested to, but I really feel like each piece has a soul. And um, so that's why I really just try to make each piece come to its own, um, its own birth and then move on to its own life with whoever buys it. Great, thank you so much, Kim. And questions for Kim now. Questions for Kim, lots of inspiration there. Um, which is really unique. Um, so um, fairly recently, I started using underglaze. I started using underglaze because, tip, mainly because I was looking for a quick way for um, my kids, my kids classes to be able to get color on their work. Um, but what I found was I'm a lover of color. My mom is, you know, just always had color, color, color. Um, so I started to incorporate that and found that um, some, some of the brighter colors, the reds and some of the blues and oranges work really well in the wood kiln and give a pop of color in a sea of brown pieces. There's going to be me with some crazy colors going on. Um, and uh, recently, I mean, we've been working with some Aribe glazes, which are kind of this beautiful green, and then also some turquoise, um, which I'm excited to try the turquoise with this brown clay, because I think that contrast is going to be really cool. Thank you. And then that was an answer to a question about her glazing and colors, which are, are very unique. And then a comment came in about enjoying your pieces at Highfield in the Highfield Hall exhibit, which certainly oh, I you. did too, and many people uh, certainly love those. Any other questions for Kim? Questions for Kim. Thank you so much, Kim. That was very inspirational. And a question did come in um, about uh, Leslie's work um, after we had moved on from Leslie which was about uh, that the example she had showed at, that Leslie showed at the beginning had three images. And uh, the question was, do all three plates go through at once or separately? That's a question for Leslie. Yes, all three um, go through the press at the same time. And they're, they're all the same height and they're just placed individually adjacent to each other and run through the press in one run. Okay, great. Any other questions for Leslie, Melissa, or Kim? And I know we all have a lot of food for thought on this because there were uh, so many interesting things here. Here's a question from Melissa. What type of yards did you use in your catcher? What makes it glow at night? Yarns, I'm sorry, they, it says yards, but that's a typo. Yarns, did you use in your, in your dream catcher? What makes it glow at night? It, they're just um, cotton yarns. And I, the, the, the glowing is just comes from the lights off of the buildings and the reflections off of the off of the dream catcher. So I haven't lit it up in any way. It just, it just glows. Very cool. Any other questions for any of our three artists? 
I know we have a lot to, I, it's gonna take me a while to digest all of this. There's been so much, uh, so much wonderful information here and um, three very inspirational artists. So uh, wonderful work, great presentations is, is one of the messages that, that just came through. And I certainly agree with that. This was really um, setting a high bar. So thank you all so much to all the artists, to Leslie and Melissa and Kim for being with us here tonight. Um, another ditto to the wonderful work, great presentations comment. And I think we certainly all agree to that. So thank you to all of the artists and thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, here's another comment, excellent, stimulating and lovely artists and uh, big thank yous to all the artists here. Um, so thank you all for coming. And uh, we do these virtual receptions once a month. Uh, next month, we're gonna have a very special presentation um, for our uh, exhibit in our, in our lobby gallery. So we'll be, we'll be sending you information about that, uh, that presentation as well. So thank you to all the artists and to everyone who joined. Here's another comment, awesome presentations, thank you. And so um, we will see you all soon in person or on Zoom and thank you all for coming tonight. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.